Uh, thank you everyone for coming out. Uh, my name is Stuart and today I'll be presenting on spearing superfish with HPKP. Um, a little bit about what we're going to be talking about. Uh, first we're going to talk about the problem that HPKP is trying to solve, then we're going to dive into what HPKP is. Um, and then after that we're going to talk about a pretty recent security incident um, with Lenovo and Superfish. And then afterwards uh, we'll wrap up with conclusion and have time for questions. So a little bit about me. Uh, currently I'm a pen tester at Yahoo. I've been there for about uh, four months. Um, before then I used to work here at MongoDB. Uh, before that I used to work at Fog Creek Software. Um, I used to work at uh, Air Force Research Labs and the Solar and Heliospheric Research Group. Uh, when I'm not at work, which is most of my day, um, I'm usually building things too. I run dating websites, cat fax spamming websites, number of security tools, and uh, you name it, I've probably built something related to it. So uh, let's jump in. So uh, the problem, when I refer to this little blue guy, I usually say you, but what I mean is you is actually like a user, agent, person, computer thing. I kind of wrap that all into one thing. I define it as like you as your person. So anyways, so we have this person here and uh, every person's computer has a number of these certificates installed on their system. These are just root certificates that your computer trusts. Um, these certificates are self-signed and this is kind of how we start the basis of our trust model for um, uh, certificates. And so like if you were to go out and check your certificates, which you're more than welcome to do, they're just they're locally installed, um, you'll see a bunch of names kind of like these. Um, these are some of like the bigger ones, VeriSign, GeoTrust, Komodo. And so your computer trusts all of these certificates and they all, they're kind of all trusted equally um, for the most part. And so, and that's a good thing. I mean, it's a good thing that we have. These are the anchors of trust for our certificates because of this way these certificates sign off on other certificates and we can kind of expand this tree of trust. And so that way when you go to a domain your computer has never seen, um, it'll look off and make sure that that new um, uh, connection is signed off by one of these things that this thing trusts. And so we have this tree of trust. Otherwise, if it didn't, you would have to keep track of every single domain that you want to trust or every HTTPS connection that you want to trust. And so these things are good. And so what that means is since you trust these, um, if VeriSign was to say, hey, this um, domain belongs to Yahoo or this, uh, this is a valid Yahoo connection, um, you would trust that because you trust uh, what VeriSign is saying. And if you were to go to Twitter and VeriSign, VeriSign is signed by Twitter, um, you would also believe that. And so VeriSign can sign off on any domain and you believe that. Well, the problem with this is, though, um, you believe all of your top-level certificates. And so that means if there is one of these top-level top certificates that isn't as secure and maybe gets compromised, if they were to sign off on Yahoo, you would completely believe that because you trust the certificate. And you would also trust if they signed off on Twitter, if they signed on Facebook. You believe this because you trust this top-level certificate. And so if an attacker was able to compromise one of these certificates, um, this is kind of like what the scenario that they would be able to do. Um, essentially, we're assuming this no secrets agency has compromised uh, one of these certificate authorities, and they can then create a, or a, they can create a certificate for yahoo.com, and when your client connects um, to yahoo.com, the, even though it's a man in the middle host, your browser is still going to give you that green little icon because your browser trusts this insecure CA. Um, and that's just, just, just how the model works right now. And so the, the no secrets agency is effectively able to kind of man in the middle in between you and the client as far as it goes um, just doesn't really have any idea that this is happening. And so is this a real problem? Um, so the problem here is that certificate authorities can be taken over and that our browsers entrust all certificate authorities uh, pretty equally. Um, and this has been a problem in the past. The two notable examples are Komodo Hacker, um, which was an incident back in 2011 um, where I think it was nine CSRs were signed off um, on like some, a related hacker or I mean a related CA to Komodo. And then back in 2011 again, um, there was DigiNotar, which is a Dutch CA that was completely compromised and a bunch of different uh, CSRs were signed off on. So this has happened before um, and it's probably still happening now. Attackers are definitely going over after CAs, certificate authorities, just because they are such a juicy target. They allow you to more easily do a man in the middle attack. There's still other trust boundaries that you have to compromise or go over for a man in the middle attack, such as name resolution, but this is the majority of the problem is the CA root of trust that you have to break into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're getting there. So, uh, so the, now I'm going to start talking about uh, which HPKP is. Um, so key pinning, um, which is kind of the basis of this, really isn't a new idea. Um, so one example is I'm sure most of us have probably used uh, SSH before. Um, so 
SSH, uh, when it first connects to a host, SSH actually records information about that host you're connecting to. It remembers either the host name and the IP address, and also the key, the public key that that host is providing. And so the next time that your SSH client connects to that host, if it sees a different public key, it knows something is wrong, because the last time you connected to this host, it returned a sp specific public key. And so this actually, uh, the SSH client actually throws an error and doesn't even allow you to connect to this host, because there's probably, I mean, something is fishy is going on. You might have seen this if you ever used like a platform uh, as a service provider, like DigitalOcean or something, when you want to connect to a host, but maybe you deleted that instance and it comes back with a new IP address behind that host name. Um, your SSH client just gets angry and you have to delete it. And so they kind of took this key pinning principle and they're trying to apply it to the web, and it's, it's working pretty well. Um, so the idea behind um, HTTP public key pinning is, is this sentence pretty much here. If there's nothing else to remember from this, it's, it's just this sentence. It's HPPKP instructs web clients to associate specific cryptographic identities with a certain web server to prevent man-in-the-middle attacks due to compromised certificate authorities. And so the idea is that when you first connect to a server, you have to remember, you want to remember little details about that server so that the next time you connect to them, if something, if they're providing completely different like information about their server, then you know something is a little fishy. So another thing to remember, um, this doesn't, people don't do this by default, um, not, any, not now anyways. Your web server has to tell clients specifically, like, hey, next time you connect to me, make sure that I have the same information. Because if I don't, there's probably someone in between our communications and you should really not connect to me or try not to connect to me. So um, this is the header. So when, you, when your client connects to one of these servers, um, the server can send back, or your server can send back um, this header. Um, it, it goes along with the rest of your headers, like host or location and all your caching headers and everything. And it's just public key pins. It doesn't need an X. It's like a full big boy header. Um, excuse me. And so the first two things in the header are pins. I'm going to get a little bit into more what pins are later. Um, but basically, they are the identities of your certificates. So each pin represents a certificate. But I'm going to talk about all that a little bit later. Um, the next field is max age. Max age is how long you want this policy to be enforced. Um, so right now it says 30, which just stands for 30 seconds. Um, I'll get a little bit into more about what, what that's useful for. But um, if you don't install uh, the headers correctly, it's possible to kind of brick your website, meaning no one can make a valid SSL connection to your website. And so it's good when you're first rolling out a header to set the max ages really small. So that way, if your policy is invalid or it's like a bad policy, your client only remembers it for like 20 or 30 seconds or something. Uh, the next directive, these are all the directives that exist for public key pins. So it's a pretty small uh, header. And the next one is uh, include subdomains. Um, the last two are optional. Um, so you can have include subdomains. And so that means like if you were to connect to yahoo.com and grab a bunch of pins, grab a bunch of pins, and it had that include subdomains, anytime you tried to connect to Yahoo after that, or like if you tried to connect to fantasy.yahoo.com or sports.yahoo.com, it would also enforce these pins on those subdomains. Kind of like if you ever used uh, HSTS, um, HTTP strict transport security, how you can use the subdomains, include subdomains directive with that, same sort of idea. And then the last one is report URI. This is very similar to the content security policy report URI. What this means, anytime there's a violation of this policy, your client um, will send a report of what happened to the server so the server can kind of know like, hey, maybe someone is trying to man, man in the middle of me right now and that it's just like some extra information. It's super useful to debugging. So on the bottom here is actually a header kind of being used um, in, in the live, I guess. This is the, the header I'm using on one of my websites. It's a no-name website that'll never actually get manned in the middle, but it's fun to install, so it does work. Uh, this is, I kind of just went over this. This is background information if anyone is uh, viewing these slides um, uh, offline. So uh, what is a pin? So in that previous example, I had two different pins. Um, they kind of looked like this in the header. Um, the pin comes from uh, the certificate. So all the way on the left um, is an example certificate. The certificates have things like your subject, the, so the subject name, what the certificate is actually binded to. So certificate is two of the different things that say it's, uh, it binds a public key with an identity. And so the identity for this is the subject, which is yahoo.com. Um, each uh, certificate is signed off by someone. It's either signed off by itself or signed off by someone else. And that's where we get those trees of trust. This one is signed off on VeriSign. Um, the next two things, like I said, it binds two things, a public key and identity. So next we have that actual public key. So you can use a couple different algorithms like RSA or Diffie-Hellman. Um, that's the algorithm. Then there's the actual public key. And then after that, we have not before, not after. So you can specify certificates to be valid for certain dates. And then after that is extensions. So to build these pin sets, um, first you're going to take the public key algorithm and the subject public key out. This is known as your SPKI, the subject public key identifier. And then you're going to take the SHA-256 of that, which is just a cryptographic hash. It kind of like 
just takes that information, kind of compresses it a little bit into a same size identifier, and you're not going to have collisions, collisions with that same set identifier. And so once you do all that, you're going to have something kind of like this, your pin SHA-256 followed by a big jumble of base64 numbers. And this is your pin. And so each certificate is going to have a very unique pin. And that's how you can identify it. And so when your browser receives one of these pins, um, the next time it tries to connect to the web server, it's going to make sure that one of these pins exists in that chain that yahoo.com provides. So I'll, I'll get into a little bit more of that. From now on, whenever I talk about pins, I kind of do it like this. I think the podium might kind of be blocking it. But basically, it just says pin SHA-256 is equal to ABC. Instead of copying this giant base64 string, I'm just replacing that with ABC. Normally, it's going to be that giant string, but that gets cumbersome on slides. So um, the next. So like I said, um, you, each pin kind of corresponds to a very specific certificate. No two certificates should have. I mean, there are cases where it could happen. But for the most part, each certificate is going to have its own unique pin once you build a pin off of it. And so you can kind of pin at every level. And so um, like I said, you can pin at every level. And so uh, there's different reasons why you would want to pin at some level. So when Yahoo issues a pin to a client and it says, hey, this pin must exist within my chain the next time you connect, um, as long as it's one of those three, if it's only a three chain high, then it's a valid connection. And so there's different reasons for pinning at different levels. For most, like if you're running a small website, it kind of makes sense to pin at the bottom level at like the yahoo.com, not any of the other ones that are building the trust models, just because your certificate probably isn't going to change that often. And it's not a big deal. If you're a larger organization, maybe you do a lot of certificate rotation. Um, it makes sense to kind of pin up a little bit ahead. So that way, a little bit up the trust model, just because you might be switching out that bottom certificate a lot. And you don't want to have to update your policy every time. Another important note when pinning, um, the first time you, or every time you establish a pin set, when your server initially tells your client to remember these pins, you have to have two different pens, at least two different pens, and they have to be within different trust uh, chains. So you couldn't do two pins like this guy and this guy because they're in the same trust model, um, just because it, just for security reasons. Um, so instead, what you want to do is have two different trust chains. So uh, normally, what people do is they actually build like a backup CSR, which is a certificate signing request. That's what you send to the CA to actually get the Yahoo.com home domain like verified. Um, so you build this little CSR. It does, no one else knows about it. You can just build one on your computer. It's not a big deal. And uh, that way you have this backup in case your yahoo.com uh, certificate gets compromised. If the key used to build this is compromised, you have this backup one. You can then issue it to the CA. The CA can be like, oh, this is a valid certificate. They can sign off on it. And you can use that one for your new pins. So uh, next slide. So now we're going to kind of go like how this all actually all works together. And so we're going to go over three days. Um, Excuse me. So on the first day, uh, we have our client user browser agent person, and they're connecting to Yahoo. First thing they're going to do is they're going to make sure that Yahoo has a valid um, SSL TLS connection and a valid uh, certificate chain, the same thing everyone's browser does today. And so the first thing they're going to do is they're going to see that it's Yahoo. That's who they're trying to connect to, so that's good. Um, they're going to see that it's signed off by some intermediate certificate authority. They don't really trust that intermediate certificate authority, so they follow it up. They see it's signed by this root certificate authority. They do trust that root certificate authority because it already exists within their computer, and they know to trust that. So they're like, woohoo, this, this certificate chain is valid. They check the not before, not after. There's some other checks they do, but they make sure that this certificate chain is valid. And so that's the first step. The second step is that the client sees that Yahoo is now publishing a public, or a public key pinning set. And so that we have these different pins. And so it's, it's going to make sure that this public key pin is valid for this certificate set. We can see that one of the pins is ABC. So it needs to make sure that one of these certificates has an SPKI of ABC. And we can see that this first one does. So it's a valid key pin set. So then it remembers that P key pin set for every other time it connects. So the next time it connects, which is Tuesday, it's connecting to Yahoo. First thing it does is it makes sure it has a valid certificate chain, um, which it does. It's the same certificate chains. You know, it belongs to Yahoo. It's connecting to Yahoo, signed off by all these CCAs. Eventually, it trusts one of the CAs on the computer. Everything's correct. The next step it does is it sees that it has, it has remembered pins. Yahoo previously told it, like, hey, next time you connect to me, make sure that one of these pins is valid. So it's going to go through its pin set, and it has pin set ABC, DEF, GHI. It's going to make sure one of those pins exists. So the first one is going to check all the certificates. It sees that, hey, it has pin ABC. And ABC was one of the SPKI subject public key identifiers of the certificate chain presented. So everything's fine. It's, it's, a, it's a valid pin set. It's still Yahoo. They're not actively being manned in the middle, hopefully. I mean, most likely not. So 
uh, Wednesday. Wednesday is a bad day. So um, unfortunately, uh, the No Secrets Agency was able to compromise an insecure CA, a CA that we trust, that all of our computers trust, like uh, or, uh, just you know the Nojitar or Digitar. And so because of this, um, they were able to write off a valid certificate for Yahoo. So, so continue on. The first thing to do is uh, the user agent's going to connect. They're going to try to connect to the Yahoo, but they're being manned in the middle, so they're going to connect to this man in the middle host. They're going to look at the certificate chain. They're going to see that it's Yahoo.com, which they're trying to connect to. Um, they, don't know, they don't trust the certificate yet, so they look up and see who they're signed off. It's signed off by this insecure CA. They actually trust this insecure, insecure CA right now. So if this was all the checks they would be doing, they would get that green little lock and everything would be valid. They would be connected to Yahoo, or they would think they'd be connected to Yahoo. But since they have this pin set remembered, next they, Yahoo told them, hey, next time you connect to me, make sure I have this, this pin set is valid. So they're going to go through their pins. They have pin ABC. They're going to see if pin ABC is within the certificate chain. It's not, so that's weird. They're going to check their backup pin, DEF, or DEF. They don't see it in the certificate chain. Weird. And they're going to check the last one, GHI, also not in the certificate pin. Because none of these pins match this insecure CA, um, they're just not going to connect to it. At this point, if you had specified a report URI, they're going to send a report URI um, to that endpoint. Uh, thing to note about the report URIs, if you set the report URI to yahoo.com, that report, your, or that report is not going to be sent to Yahoo because they can't establish a valid connection right now because it's being managed in the middle. Um, so normally it's a good idea to set that report URI to a different, uh, a different host, so like yahoo.report.com or something like that. Um, the, the RFC says that um, if the client can try later to send these reports, um, I don't know too much if it does or what it does right now, but it might try to connect to Yahoo uh, later if, that, if that's what you specified as your report URI. But anyways, um, we were successfully able to stop a man in the middle because the pin set worked, and uh, whew, we weren't, our credentials were not stolen. Cool. So uh, the next part of the talk, I'm going to talk about Lenovo and Superfish. I'm sure uh, we all heard about this and uh, kind of the blunders related to this, but uh, uh, Lenovo for a while um, started a, kind of in the fall of last year. They were pre-installing an adware called uh, Superfish. Um, what this thing would do is uh, it would display ads in Google searches. You can kind of see it right here. It's called Visual Discovery. Um, if you go read the forms, it was actually kind of funny. The, they were talking about how it was like a great benefit to their user and stuff, which may be true, but it's still very shady. And I don't, I don't think most people like ads. So uh, anyways, the company was called Superfish. Um, the, and Superfish, I mean, it wasn't too bad, just the adware. But the problem was how they went around installing this adware. As you saw that this is, um, Google uses uh, HTTPS for their Google search, obviously. And so normally, you shouldn't be able to inject ads into an HTTPS stream. And that's kind of like one of the things we build HTTPSs for no snooping and no injecting. And so how, did, I mean, how were they able to do that? And so we found out that Lenovo pre-installed self-signed root certificates on every laptop they released, which is, I mean, kind of a weird thing to do. But I mean, sometimes it could be valid. But the other the thing they did further than that is they installed the same um, self-signed root certificate on all of those machines. And furthermore, that the private key used on to sign all of those was uh, easily crackable, and it was like crackable in like three hours. And so now any attacker can grab this certificate and use this to man in the middle any host um, that they would like to, as long as they have the infrastructure to actually man in the middle of the host, which is terrible. I mean, this brings us back to HTTP, meaning that any person that has one of these Lenovo laptops that has this self-signed certificate on it, which is quite a few laptops, them, I mean, their bank statements, emails, messages, all visible again, as long as you're not using like E2E or something, or end-to-end -end encryption, which most people don't. And so, I mean, that, that's terrible. I mean, it's a, a serious security blunder. And so it also gives nation states, ISPs, backbone providers, and another vector for information snooping. And so uh, this is the embarrassing part of the talk. Um, so MongoDB and Yahoo were talking about how we wanted to do an OWASP talk, and I had just learned about, uh, it was when Lenovo was going on, and I just learned about HPKP. And it seemed to make sense in my head that why can't we just supply HPKP to the Superfish certificate? When Yahoo publishes a pin set, they would see that the Superfish certificate doesn't exist in there, and so Superfish shouldn't be able to sign off on them. Uh, but the, the problem is that it doesn't quite work that way. Um, uh, this is Adam Langley's blog, Ultraviolet. He, um, he kind of talks. He talks about this, um, this is back in like 2011, but uh, basically it says user installed root CAs are given the authority to override pins, um, which means that any CA that's signed locally on your machine, um, if it signs another certificate, uh, it basically, uh, pinning won't protect against that, which kind of makes sense, because a lot of people are using like, you know, corporate man the middle proxies and like data flow analysis and stuff. A lot of people are already gonna, or organizations are gonna have these locally installed CAs. 
And so they decided uh, public key pinning shouldn't really interfere with that. And because of that, you cannot actually use HPKP2 stop uh, superfish, unfortunately. But um, so this is the, the last slide. So I mean, not that uh, HPKP isn't without all of its benefits. I mean, it's still a great tool. I mean, the tool it actually tries, or the problem it actually tries to solve is uh, compromised certificate authorities. And if that does happen, and it has happened in the past plenty of times, if you're a large organization, it is actively happening. Um, this is what uh, HPKP tries to solve. But uh, in conclusion, uh, we talked about uh, what the problem was um, that HPKP was trying to solve. We discussed what HPKP was, the header that your server can release to, for binding cryptographic identities. And then uh, we talked about uh, the recent Lenovo Superfish problem. Uh, this concludes my talk. Are there any questions? Chris. Yeah, so you mentioned backup CSRs. Um, mm -hmm. What if I didn't use a backup CSR, I just did the work in, and my cert expired, and my max age did not expire? Is it possible to shoot myself in the foot and make my dock my own site? Um, so part of that is true, part of that isn't true. Um, when you first install, um, you have to have two valid pins, actually, and those two pins cannot be in the same chain. So you can't quite do that, but you can still shoot yourself in the foot. So uh, one of the crypto chat, I believe is the company, they do a, one of those like anonymous sort of chat things. It was kind of a big deal for a while. Um, they, they screwed up their policy and no one was able to connect to them using a valid uh, TLS connection. Um, you get like this error message like, hey, pins cannot be identified and it has like the little Chrome logo. Um, you can very easily shoot yourself in the foot if you bind the wrong certificates, a bunch of clients connect to them, and the next time they connect, you're using a different certificate that isn't in that pin set. Uh, there's no way you can't block that because if you could like say, hey, just ignore my certificates for a little, or the pin set for a little bit, obviously a, a man in the middle attacker would say, hey, just ignore it for a little bit. I swear I'm actually Yahoo. So obviously you can't do that. Um, the only way to really get around that is to talk to the browser vendors and say, hey, I screwed up my HPKP. I'm actually this person. Can you please release a patch and update everyone's uh, clients, which I don't think they like doing. So, And it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while to do that too. Are there any other questions? Yes, please. Sometimes when you've got a protection, the result is that someone could jujitsu you and turn it into a like a denial of service mm -hmm. or something. So, so what, what's the Achilles heel of someone who says, "Oh, they're doing that. Let me think how I'll screw them." Um, so, okay. So, yeah, the question was like, how can we kind of use HPKP against ourselves? Um, how could someone? Yeah, how can someone? Um, one big example that's kind of noted a lot is what if you're connecting to a host um, that doesn't have HPKP, you're doing an act of man in the middle on a host that doesn't have HPKP, you could technically install HPKP on their website. And so then a bunch of clients are going to connect to that website and you're going to be using an invalid certificate when you're doing that. And then once you stop manning in the middle of them, no other host is going to be able to connect to this host because they have an invalid pin set that isn't going to match the actual real host. So a big point, thank you for bringing this up actually, is a. Uh, HPKP is a time of first use tofu, and so it trusts whatever it sees the first time. And so if you're being manned in the middle the very first time you connect to that website, they're going to trust an invalid pin set. Normally this isn't going to be the case. I mean, we connect to Facebook and Yahoo quite often and all that stuff, but it is, it is a worry. Um, for a while, a lot of the browsers, you could actually tell them what your pins were, and they would install it. Oh, my bad. Hello? Sorry about that. Um, for a while, you could talk to the, the browsers and say, hey, these are my pins. And they maintain that list for a long time. The list is growing kind of big, actually. Um, but you can say, hey, these are what the pins are, and only allow um, clients to connect if they see these valid pins. Google was the first. They were the first people to do this. Um, you can do that. And so that way, you can get rid of the uh, time of first use. But otherwise, there is real no, no real solution besides like some sort of pre-shared key solution. Good question. Any others? <laughs> Another one? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure they all work on mobile browsers too. So I mean, as long as you're using a browser, this, is, this comes into effect. It's just an HTTP header that gets sent from any web request. And what if it's a mobile app and it's, is there, is, will this help me in any case if I'm worried about running mobile apps in bad places? Oh, definitely, yeah. So like if you're, um, I guess I don't want to say, like uh, if you are in a bad place, yeah, definitely. I mean, that's, that's what this is. Uh, built to do. If there's any place where you're worried about a rogue CA, I guess, which is globally, anywhere you can worry about a rogue CA, this is, this is what was built to solve that problem. So, so and, most definitely. And in my mobile app, could I solve the first use problem 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of applications actually pin keys public, or they do like like the SSH client I mentioned. So like when you first do it, that's you can build it into your app yourself. So if you know the server you're going to connect to, you can remember their uh, their public key. And if you don't see that public key, you can be like, whoa, which is exactly which is this this that's the same thing. So you can program it yourself if you like. Well, you can use this. So, uh, so with since you're publishing this policy all the time, um, whenever a client connects to it, um, they're going to re-download the pin set. So, if the pin set is different, um, that's okay as long as it's still a valid connection. So, for example, um, if your Yahoo, let's say your pin set was initially this certificate and that certificate, if their certificate, this certificate, for some reason was compromised, you can start issuing this certificate on your Yahoo domain and then find build another backup CSR and just kind of change it like that. So you can kind of roll out certificates as long as one of those certificates is valid. At all times, one of those pins has to be good. Excellent. Okay, good. Yep. yep. Are there any other questions? All the way in the back. Awesome. So Yeah, so anything, any proxy that's in the middle can establish headers. It's just like a standard HTTP header. You can just add it on whatever stage you'd like to. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for coming out.